सहनावतु सहनो भुनक्त सह वीर करवाहे तेजस्वी नवधीतमस्तुमाषावे ओ शातिशाशा दृगृश्य विवेक दी वर्स आई स्टार्ट चैंटिंग टुडे इज verses 8 and 9 which we did last time those who have books can follow me aham karasya tadatmyam aham karasya tadatmyam chichhaya deha sakshi bhi chichhaya deha sakshi bhi सहज कर्म जंभ्रांति सहज कर्म जंभ्रांति जन्म चिविधम क्रमा जन्म चिविधम क्रमा संबंधिनो सतोर्नास्ति संबंधिनो सतोर्नास्ति निवृत्ति सहजस् तो निवृत्ति सहजस् तो कर्म क्षया प्रबोधा चर्म क्षया प्रबोधा चवर्ते ते क्रमादुभे ते ते क्रमादुभे वी बीन स्टडिंग दिस ओल्ड वेदांतिक टेक्स्ट दृग दृश्य विवेक which is an introduction to the system of advaita vedanta the non dual vedanta according to advaita vedanta we are not this body of flesh and blood we are not even our minds thoughts feelings emotions ideas memories we are not even that then what are we we are the witness of the body and mind the witness consciousness called the sakshi which literally means the witness so we are the witness consciousness ever shining upon the mind and through the mind working on the body and through the body and mind experiencing this universe and interacting with this universe but we are not the body nor the mind just as as much as i am not this um, scarf or the shirt so just as we are not our clothes the body and mind are coverings for our true nature which is pure consciousness and what is this pure consciousness and how are we to appreciate grasp understand this this we saw in the first class in the very beginning the first very first verse now we have this pure consciousness shining on the mirror of the mind and just as if i put a mirror in front of me my face will be reflected in the mirror similarly we the pure consciousness the witness consciousness consciousness is reflected in the mirror of the mind and this is the awareness which we all experience all the time right now feel it the sentience the awareness the consciousness which we are, we feel all the time we are conscious we feel it inside us in our minds that consciousness is a reflection of the pure consciousness or the witness consciousness which you really are this face which i see always in the mirror is a reflection of my true face which i do not see i see only that face and this reflected consciousness is our individual existence in terms of conventional religion when you read in the bible god made man in his image god the pure consciousness reflected as the reflected consciousness in the mirror of the mind that is the image of pure consciousness as much as my the reflected face in the mirror is the image of my real face god made man in his own image the reflected consciousness is us it's the subtlest idea that we can get out ourselves think about it physical body flesh and blood the nervous system our our memories our ideas our thoughts 
deeper than that, the blankness of deep sleep, the consciousness that we perceive in ourselves is that reflected consciousness. And that is the, and if you identify yourself with that, then you are an individual human being. What Vedanta tells you is, that is a reflection of your true nature. You, I am not the reflected face. I've gotten into, as if I've gotten into the habit of thinking of myself as the reflected face. What is the problem with the reflected face? The problem is this. Every problem of the mirror becomes a problem of the reflected face. Mirror is dirty, the reflected face feels, I am dirty. And the mirror is polished, the reflected face feels, oh, I am so shiny today. I am neither dirty nor shiny. It's a reflection and the reflection depends on the reflecting medium. The reflecting medium is the mirror. Whatever the conditions of the mirror, that will be the condition of the reflected face. Mirror is shattered. The reflection is broken. Reflected face thinks, oh, I am dying. None of it is true. I am neither, the real face is neither dirty nor polished, nor living nor dying. It's a reflection which says all that. So all the problems of the mirror becomes the problems of the reflected face. All the problems of the mind and the physical body and in connection with the external world, all of that becomes my problem once I identify myself with the reflected consciousness in my mind. I am this limited conscious entity, mind, body, and the consciousness within. That's what I become. Vedanta tells me, you are not that. Now, in the mind, there is this I, which I, nothing mystical about it, the I, the Sanskrit aham, I, the ego, mm, the big guy, the I. <laughs> um, that I, the text tells us, concentrate on that I. That I is connected to the body. That I our I, the ego, I means the vertical one, not the. <laughs> that I is connected to the body. How? I am this body. This is my body. That's how. And that I is connected to the reflected consciousness. I am always aware. Whenever I think of myself, I think of myself as, an, as a sentient being, as an aware being, as a conscious being. So the I in the mind is attached, is, is identified with the reflected consciousness in the mind. And the I, what relation does it bear to the true I, which Vedanta tells us about, the witness consciousness? These three questions were taken up last time. It's a subtle topic, that's why I'm repeating this. What were the questions? The I, the ego that we feel in, our, in ourselves, how is it connected to the body? How is it connected to the awareness that we have in our minds? And how is it connected to the real self which Vedanta talks about? Vedanta talks about ourselves as existence, consciousness, bliss. And this I, which we feel right now, how, what relation does it bear to existence, consciousness, bliss? And the three answers are given in the next verse, in verse number eight and then nine. What are the questions? How are they related? And the second set of questions will be, how can these relations be cut? How can the I be free of these things? The answers are like this. The I is related to the body. In all of us, the I is related to the body by karma. This body has been worked up by my past karma. As long as this karma, which is giving results in this life called prarabdha karma, karma which has begun to give results, as long as this karma is giving results, this body will live. And the body dies when the karma gives out. That, that portion of my karma, accumulated karma, gives away. And the body dies. Up to that point, up to the death of the body, the I in the body is related to the body. The I in the body is related to the body. Even the greatest saint, Ramakrishna Paramahansa, he says, my hand is broken. Whose hand? The body. So the body... The hand is broken, so he says, I, I, my, my hand is broken. Can you tell me what I can do about it? Why does my hand get broken? So that's one usage. There's also another usage which makes a difference between Ramakrishna Paramahansa and the rest of us, which we shall see a little later. So I am related to this body. You can't help it. Second, I is related to consciousness, the reflected consciousness. How? He says it's natural. 
natural relationship. What do you mean by natural relationship? The reflected face in the mirror and the mirror, they have a natural relationship. Whenever you, I put a face, a mirror in front of my face, my face will be reflected in the mirror. There will be a reflection. You can't help it. Mirror will give you a reflection. And what is the relationship between the mirror and the reflected face? It's natural. As long as the mirror is there, the reflected face is there. If the reflected face is there, it means that the mirror is there. Similarly, my, the eye and consciousness, reflected consciousness, whenever the mind throws up an eye function, I, I exist. And that will always be a sentient eye, conscious eye. Because you, the pure consciousness, witness consciousness, you are shining upon your mind. So the eye feeling in the mind will always appear as a shining eye. When will they be? When will they go? When the mind stops functioning, when you sh turn the mirror and put it down, face down, there will be no reflection. Similarly, in deep sleep, when the mind shuts down, there is no eye feeling. There is no eye feeling. We do not feel I am sleeping. Then you are not sleeping. So there is no eye feeling at that time because the mind has shut down. And hence, the reflected consciousness is also not there. So you don't feel I am a conscious being in deep sleep. It explains why in deep sleep, Though we are pure consciousness, yet we do not feel it like a conscious being in deep sleep. All this is secondary. The real question is a third question. What is the relationship between I, the witness consciousness, Sakshi, and this I in the, in the mind? And the author answers dramatically, there's no relationship. It's a confusion. You are not related to the mirror. My face is in no way related to the mirror. I don't care if there is a mirror. The mirror borrows a reflection of my face and, um, and there's an image of my face in the mirror. But my face has no relation to the mirror. Mirror may be shiny, mirror may be dirty, mirror may be expensive, mirror may be cheap, mirror may be broken. It makes no difference whatsoever to my face. In the same way, you, the witness consciousness, has no relationship with the I. But we are completely related. We feel I am that I. And that is ignorance. That is ignorance. That is the exact point. And this is a very beautiful way of presenting it. What does Vedanta do? That's exactly what it does. That false relationship between the I in the mind and the pure consciousness shining upon the mind, that false relationship is cut. Well, how can a relationship of ignorance be cut? How can ignorance be cut? Only by the sword of knowledge. Only by the sword of knowledge. You just have to become aware that I shine upon the mind and that is the consciousness which we feel in the mind right now. I am not related to the mind. The moment you snap your relationship with the I in the mind, you are free. That is the whole endeavor of Advaita Vedanta. It's a very beautiful way of very precisely pointing where does Advaita Vedanta uh, strike? Where does it strike? Okay. Now let us go on to the 10th verse. First the Sanskrit, then I'll explain and then I'll explain the Sanskrit too. Ahankara lae supto Ahankara lae supto Bhavet de hope ya chetana Ahankara vikas ardha Ahankara vikas ardha Swapna servas to jagaraham Swapna servas to jagaraham so, now the question is, we have to understand the question, and then only the answer will make sense. The question is, if I am pure consciousness, unchanging consciousness, the key word here is unchanging consciousness, not subject to increase or decrease. I found in this country, you have got these dimmer switches. You turn, the, so the light becomes dim, or the light becomes bright. So... Consciousness is not subject to that. You cannot dim it or make it bright. But a question should come in our minds. We experience the you know, intensity of awareness at times in, in the day when we are 
wake up in the morning fresh and have a cup of coffee and good to go, feel very conscious. And um, when you come back at night and you're ready for bedtime, you just can't keep your eyes open about to go to bed or sitting in the Vedanta class. That, that also happens. <laughs> you don't feel all that conscious. You don't feel all that conscious. And in dreaming, you feel a different kind of consciousness. And in deep sleep, you don't feel consciousness at all. We don't feel any consciousness. How can you say that we are constant, unchanging consciousness? This is the question. How do you explain this variation in our intensity of consciousness that we feel when we are wide awake, when we are sleepy or dreaming or in deep sleep? There seems to be so much variation in our state of consciousness. And the answer is given here. The answer is this. Consciousness remains the same. It is changes in the mind which cause the reflected consciousness to appear bright sometimes and sometimes dim, and sometimes not there at all. It is changes in the mind. The mind, when it is awake and fully functioning, we feel, I am conscious. I am awake, ready for anything. When the mind is tired, exhausted, we feel bored, sleepy, not so conscious, not so aware. And when the mind shuts down in deep sleep, we don't feel conscious at all. It's like a mirror. When it is bright and polished, you can see a very clear reflection of your face. When it is foggy, you see only a vague outline of your face. And when it's turned down, you don't see any reflection of your face at all. But the face remains exactly the same. In the same way, the mind, or more specifically, the author says, the ego sense. The mind itself and the ego sense is most active in what we call our waking state. Is less active, the author says half active, partially active, in what we call our dream state. And is not active, it's in a potential, like computers these days have sleep mode. Computers are, are very efficient, you know, you don't touch them for some time, they go off to sleep. <laughs> so, um, like Vedanta students. <laughs> so... Uh, the, when the mind goes to sleep, we don't see any reflection of consciousness there. And then we feel that there's no consciousness, but the pure consciousness is exactly the same. And that's what he says, the states of consciousness are really not states of consciousness. Consciousness has no states. The states are states of the mind. Waking is a state of the mind. We commonly, it is commonly used, waking state of consciousness, dream state of consciousness. No harm in using it, but as Vedanta students, we should know exactly what we are talking about. It's okay to speak about the waking state of consciousness, but we should know we are speaking about the waking state of the mind. The mind is changing. Mind gets energetic. The mind gets dull. The mind gets tired. The mind goes to sleep. So there's a waking state of the mind, there's a dream state of the mind, and there's a deep sleep state of the mind. These are states of the mind, not states of the consciousness. The consciousness is always there watching. Just like uh, Swami, I think I mentioned this, the train example. Um, we have this big train in, uh, in India called the Rajdhani Express. And well, Swami Nishreshanji, who is, used to come from South Africa, I have not seen, the, seen him, but our senior Swami told me, he had this wonderful way of explaining Vedanta through stories. So he says, when you go to the platform, uh, there's the station master standing on the platform and there's a lot of hustle and bustle. Why? This VIP, this big train, this prestigious train is coming into the platform. And it's the express comes in and the people get out of it, people get into it. There's a lot of commotion, a lot of transactions, a lot of things going on. After some time, the station master is watching. After some time, the, the train leaves the, station, the platform. The station master did not come with the train, did not go away with the train. After some time, another train comes in. It's a goods train. It's a freight train. And there are not, there are hardly anybody, there's hardly anybody who gets on, who gets off. It's just the, the train driver who gets down, maybe has a cup of tea. And then again, the train leaves the platform. Station master did not come with the train, did not go away with the train. And there, are no, there is no train in the platform. It's blank. Station master watches the empty platform. Just like that, our waking state arrives in the morning. As the alarm rings, the Rajdhani Express pulls up to the platform. <laughs> 
so much activity. You have to get up and you have to uh, get ready and go to office or uh, and get the, you know the kids ready for taking them to school. And you have a mortgage and you have taxes and you have and you have expectations. Today is the day I get my salary or I get my promotion. Today is the day I, then uh, I'm looking forward to that donut or coffee in Starbucks on the way to. Uh, it's the Rajdhani Express. <laughs> so many people, good and bad, and it's it's your life, Rajdhani Express. Come back in the evening, and at night, lie down to sleep. Rajdhani Express de departs the platform. The waking world disappears. And in its place comes a vague dream world. The good strain pulls up. Not so much happening, not so clear and bright. You are the watcher. And then the good strain pulls out. The dream also disappears. Nothing. You are the watcher of that nothing too. You exist. But you are not that body. You are not the mind also. The mind also has shut down. You are still there. Not you as Mr. or Mrs. So-and-so. Mr. and Mrs. So-and-so is the identity of the body. Not you as the individual jiva with knowledge, memories, feelings, desires, uh, expectations. That is the subtle body inside. Even that has shut down. You are the pure consciousness which you always wear. So look at the verse. Ahankara laye supto, in deep sleep, when the ego sense shuts down. Bhave deho apya chetana. The mind shuts down and the body also shuts down. And you go into deep sleep. It's a, prop, it, it's a function of the mind, the ahankara specifically, that shuts down. Consciousness is still there. Ahankara vikasa the swapna. When the ego sense and the mind start working partially, dreams come up. Body is still lying there, but the dreams come up. We inhabit a dream world and we have a dream body. And when the ahankara, the mind with the ego, becomes fully active, sarvastu jagaraha, when it's fully active, you have a waking state. And this is what we experience. These are states of the mind, not states of consciousness. Okay. Eleventh verse. How do the dream and the waking states take place? Because in deep sleep, there is it's shut down. But dreams and waking, how do they take place? There is an explanation. Eleventh verse. Anta karana vrittescha. Karana vrittescha. Chete chayaikya magata. The mechanism of our waking experiences and our dream experiences, what it says is, when the ego starts functioning, consciousness reflected upon the ego, and we become a conscious, limited individual, I. Chiti chaya ekya magata. When the reflected consciousness becomes identified with the active ego. Then what happens? In dream state, the mind has lots of impressions gathered from the waking state. What we have seen, what we have heard, what we have done, all those things are there. Memories are there. They are used to make a movie, a film. So we watch a film. That's dream. And in the waking state, when the ego becomes even more active, body gets consciousness. And we wake up. Consciousness spreads up to the body. And we wake up and we use our sense organs and motor organs to sense and act and interact with the external world. That's our waking state. What's the dream state? Mind shut down. Consciousness as it is. What's the uh, that's a deep sleep state? What's the dream state? Mind starts working partially, the ego is partially active, and consciousness reflected on the ego starts using the memories, the, the stuff stored on the, on, the, on the memory chips of your camera to make a movie out of it and watches the movie. And when you wake up, the consciousness spreads, is transmitted from the mind to the physical body also, and our sense organs and motor organs become active, sense, sensory system becomes active, and we interact with the world. That's the waking state. These are the three states, and this is how it works. What about the consciousness? 
Same unchanged consciousness. Because of you, all this happens in the body-mind. It is the same consciousness who opens a door in his house and it's, it's the counter for a shop and sells and buys with the world outside. And when the evening comes, this gentleman closes the door and he goes to his living room and switches on the TV and watches TV. And when he's tired of that, he switches off the TV and goes to his bedroom and sleeps. Three areas, three states, waking and transacting with the world. The shop, he runs a shop, the shopkeeper. We are shopkeepers. We transact, we buy and sell with the world, we transact with the world. We take in, take in sense in, inputs from the world, we see, we hear, we smell, we taste, we touch. And we act, we speak, we walk, we catch hold of something, we do things with our uh, physical body. So this is buying and selling with the world, it is our waking state. And then we sh when we shut this down, we go retreat into the living room of our minds and with, we switch on the TV and of, the, of dreams and watch it for some time. When the mind is also switched off, the TV is switched off, we retreat into a deep sleep state, bedroom. But its consciousness is the same consciousness. So this is what is said here. Antakkarana vrittishya, the functioning of the mind, chiti chaya aikyam agata. Chiti chaya, reflection of consciousness. Usually chit, the word is used. Here chiti, the feminine term is used. It means pure consciousness. So the pure consciousness reflected in the mind, what happens? Uses vasana kalpayet swapne. Vasana, impressions, the recordings in our mind. They generate dreams. And after waking up, bodhe, when you wake up, akshair with the sense organs, not just eyes, with all the sense organs, vishayan bahi, external uh, Form, sound, taste, smell, all these we take in and we experience. So this, this is our life. This is our life. The Panchadashi, probably the work of the same author, Vidyaranya Swami, who lived in a place near Mysore, in Karnataka. Yes. So there he extends this idea further. He says, this is the story of your day. Which day? Every day. And the story is repeated the next day. Tadvad dinantare, the next day. And then, Masabda yuga kalpeshu, gatagammeshu ne kadaha. Month, next month, same story. Same, same. <laughs> and next year, the same story. Waking, dreaming, sleeping. And the years pass into decades and the body grows older. The body dies. The subtle body goes to other worlds and there are other lives. And, but the story remains the same. Consciousness watching and experiencing through the body and the mind. He says years pass. Eons pass. Millions of years. The Hindus have an enormous calendar. Uh, enormous, uh, you know, a vast sense of time. Millions of years and billions of years are for them one day in the life of Brahma. <laughs> The creator, the creatrix, or whatever you call it, who created the universe. Just one day. And when Brahma goes to sleep, the world collapses upon itself and this uh, dissolution. But you, the consciousness, you're still watching that. You were there at the Big Bang. And you'll be there when the universe disappears into itself as the consciousness. Yuga Kalpeshu Gata Gammeshu Nekada. Look at the awesome poetry. Millions of years have gone. Universes have been created and destroyed. And there are many more years, uh, millions of years to come and universes to be created and destroyed and lives to live unless we get enlightenment. You can go on repeating this. Nothing can destroy us. Nothing can. The worst of tragedies, the most terrible of sorrows, the greatest of catastrophes which can destroy worlds has not been able to destroy us till today and will not be able to destroy us. Nothing can destroy us. Nothing can scratch you. <laughs> so, and it will go on. No deti nastameti samvid esha swayam prabha. Vidarnya Swami says, the sun of consciousness neither rises nor sets. Self-effulgent sun of consciousness. You're just reading Swami Brahmananda. Uh, a couple of days ago, we celebrated his birth anniversary. 
So one of the first experiences which he had with the blessings of Sri Ramakrishna, he says, a light like a million suns engulfing me. It's his own light. It's our light. When we, when we realize what we are really. And the tragedy is it's here right now. And comple completely, totally, continuously available to us. A very senior monk told me once, he said, Vishwarup, we are missing it a thousand times every second. It's there, we are missing it a thousand times every second. Anyhow, this book intends to make us acquainted with what we already have. Now, a new question will come up. A new question will come up. What about birth and death? What is born? How does birth take place? How does death take place? What happens after death? So this uh, author has uh, certainly got style. You know, he disposes of these enormous questions with a single verse. So the next verse he'll tell us how we live and how we die. How life after life comes and goes. What happens exactly he'll tell us in the next verse. Twelfth verse. Mano hankrityupadanam Mano ahankrityupadanam Lingam mekam jadatmakam Avastha trayaman veti Jayate mriyate tatha it is the subtle body. Remember, the Hindu view of the human personality is trichotomous. Physical body, and we reflect inwards a subtle body, and beyond that, I'm not talking about the causal body here, we are beyond that, our true, true reality, pure consciousness. Trichotomous view. Really, we are pure consciousness, and because of our ignorance, we are identified with these two other bodies. This physical body and the subtle body dwelling in this physical body at present. Now, what is birth and what is death? Birth is when the subtle body with which we are associated, when it comes and takes up residence in the mother's womb, in the child which is conceived. That is birth and then the child is born. So a physical body is created and I take up residence in it. That is birth. And this physical body dies, I leave this physical body and go to other worlds and other lives. That is death. So birth and death are not of the pure consciousness as such. The pure consciousness is completely unaffected. Birth and death are experienced and are, are relevant to the subtle body. It is a subtle body which takes birth through the birth of the physical body. It is a subtle, subtle body which experiences death. It does not die. It experiences death with the death of the physical body. Why don't you sit down? Yeah. Um, so, physical bodies are born and physical bodies die. And the subtle body goes from body to body. The subtle body is called, with the consciousness, the subtle body is called the jiva, the individual. Pure consciousness itself is Brahman. But the pure consciousness limited by one subtle body is one jiva. So how many jivas? As many subtle bodies. And this subtle body, what is it constituted of? This subtle body has what we call um, three aspects. Three aspects. The, the vital sheet called pranamaya kosha. The vital sheath. That which makes us breathe in and out. So in yoga you do pranayama. It's an effort to control the prana by controlling the breathing. Breathing itself is not prana. It's due to prana. It's because of prana that we, our lungs inflate and deflate and we breathe. So breathing, the circulation of blood in our veins, the assimilation of food, transforming food into flesh and blood, into this physical body, all the activities powering this body, Powering the body-mind complex is the job of the pranamaya kosha, the vital sheath. So when we feel hunger, it's the prana. Thirst, it's the prana. You feel satisfied after a good meal, it's the prana which is satisfied. You feel healthy, prana. You feel sick, prana. So it's the prana. And uh, the yogis, actually with all their 
asanas and breathing and the kriyas, they try to control the prana to get, get a more healthier body and mind. So, pranamaya kosha. That's one constituent of our subtle body. And another constituent of a subtle body is the manomaya kosha, which includes the feeling of I-ness, the, the feeling, the egoism. It, it includes our vasanas, our memories, uh, the thinking, sankalpa vikalpatmi kamana. Should I do this or should I not do this? And that's the mind. And another function, another part of the subtle body is the vijnanamaya kosha, the intellect. That which we are using right now to understand Vedanta, where we get knowledge, where we get knowledge. Should I go to the Vedanta class or not? That's the mind. I will go to the Vedanta class. That's the intellect. Right? So, the determinative function, uh, which, which is, uh, that's the definition given in Vedanta. So, these three sheaths, the sheath of the intellect, Vijnanamaya Kosha, the sheath of the mind, Manomaya Kosha, the sheath of the Prana, Pranamaya Kosha, together are called the subtle body. When it inhabits a physical body, it's a living body. When it departs from a physical body, we call it a dead body. The body is dead. That's why in English you say, he gave up the ghost. The ghost here is the subtle body. When death is, giving up the ghost. So in, here in, uh, in the Western world, we say that you gave up the ghost. In India, you say just the opposite. He gave up the body. The subtle body gives up the physical body. The moment the subtle body leaves the physical body, it's a dead body. And uh, we hear of so many of these near-death experiences of people when the body is dying. You actually experience seeing the dead or dying body from above. So many such accounts are there. Just today itself somebody was telling me. So that's the subtle body. The Holy Mother, Ma Sharda, once says that she left her physical body and she felt so free. After some time, she didn't want to come back into this, she says, this dirty cage of flesh and bone. She didn't want to come back. So, there's a subtle body which takes birth by the birth of the physical body. The subtle body which experiences death when the physical body breaks apart. And this is what Krishna told Arjuna. Death of the body is not final. We give up an old body, a tattered body, non-functioning body, just as you discard old clothes. As a human being discards old clothes and puts on a new set of clothes, so also the soul here, the subtle body. Of course, pure consciousness always is there, but unaffected, like the sun shining. The subtle body goes to a new set, a new physical set, a new set of clothes, as it were. An example which I like giving is this. Imagine buckets in the garden, buckets. And the buckets have water in them, big buckets, small buckets, colored buckets, and so on. Good buckets and not so good ones. And new ones and old ones. And there's water in them. Somewhere the water is dirty, somewhere it's clean, somewhere a lot of water, and very little water. But in all of them, the sun is reflected. And you'll find a little sun shining there in all those, in the water in all those buckets. Separate, little suns shining there. Now imagine, the little sun is is conscious. So what does it feel? I am this bucket. So the, if it comes to Vedanta, you'll have to explain to him, you are not the bucket. The bucket is like the physical body. Okay, I am the water in the bucket. Here is this lots of clean water. And I am the water in the bucket. No, you are not the water too. Okay, I am this little dot of light shining in the water. No, you are not that too. Look up. When you, when you look up, Suddenly it finds not looking up at the sun, it rather becomes the sun looking down at its own reflection. That is Vedanta. The physical, the bucket is our physical body, the water is our subtle body. And the little sun shining there is the reflected consciousness, chidabhasa, chitchaya, which we feel right now, the awareness. And the sun is the real self, is the pure consciousness, is the witness consciousness. We have to boldly say, that is what I am. Don't say my real self, like my, my kidney or my lung. <laughs> my, my real self is all right, Swami, but I have a lot of problems. <laughs> no. The problems are in the bucket. Some bucket is broken, some bucket is cracked and leaking, some bucket, or some bucket is not too bad, but it sees an, another bucket which is much more shiny nearby and feels jealous. <laughs> yep.
So, not the bucket, not even the water. So somewhere the water is very clean, well, Ganges water and feels, I'm holy, I'm, a, I'm the holy water. And, and somewhere else it's mixed with maybe alcohol or something and it feels, I'm dirty. Or something, you know, or, or drain water, sewage water, I'm dirty. But in both cases, you are, the, you are not affected by the water. You are the light shining in that. Even the sunlight shining in that water is not affected by the water. But whether it's holy water or dirty water or more water, you know, somewhere I have Mensa level, super genius, the subtle body. Some may be dull. Dullness and being a genius are qualities of the water, of the, of the subtle body. Not of the consciousness reflected in them. So, we have to be, that, that little son has to be told that you are not the bucket, you are not the water. When the bucket develops a leak, what does the gardener do? The gardener picks up the leaking bucket and pours the water into another new bucket. And when the water is poured into another bucket, the little reflected sun in the water travels with it and goes into the new bucket. And the old bucket is thrown away, recycled. Yeah, God recycles. <laughs> really, everything is recycled again. So now that little sun in the new bucket says, OK, I am born, born again. <laughs> so here is, here is, my, is my body. Of course, it doesn't remember. but. So now it has a new body. But all the while the real sun is unaffected. Another interesting thing, the little sun in each bucket cannot identify. For, for it, the other buckets are different individuals. Here are other people, different minds, different little suns shining in each bucket. But when the little sun realizes its oneness, it realizes that I am the real sun shining in that bucket as little sun, it will also realize I am the real sun shining in all buckets as the little sun in all these buckets. I am the consciousness in everything. So I alone shine as an existence in everything. Krishna says to Arjuna in the Gita, Kshetragyam chapimam vidhi sarvakshetreshu bharata. O Arjuna, know me alone to be the consciousness in the minds of all of all living beings. I am the one consciousness. Know me alone to be the little sun in all these buckets. He tells Arjuna. So it is the mind which is born, it is the mind which experiences, mind which, I mean the mind get, experiences birth with the birth of the body, mind experiences death with the death of the body, the mind experiences transmigration from one body to another body. To, will this always go on? It has a stop. It will come to a stop. When the mature mind does not want this game anymore and wants the game of life to stop in the in the evening of, not a physical life, in the evening of our lives as souls, in the evening of a soul, it feels that the need has come to stop. Is there something beyond this? The little sun searches for the real sun then. And that's when you come to the Vedanta class. <laughs> yes, they say it's a sign of a mature soul to seek spiritual knowledge. I was just thinking, Vedanta does not push itself forward, does not advertise itself and push itself forward. Vedanta waits until you feel a need for it. Mm. What good is it? What good will it do? Will it get, get me, will it cure my disease and will it give, give me a job and will it uh, give me great health and everything? No. Hey, what good is it then? No good. Go ahead. <laughs> Try your best. Do whatever you like in this world. Try your best. There are technologies for the Indian spiritual heritage has technologies for all of this. It, if you want good health, there is a most sophisticated technology. The Hatha Yoga technologies are there. You want good health? Yes. You want wealth, you want a good life, you want good experiences in life. The law of karma tells us the more merit you have, punyam, do good, accumulate merit, you will get a series of pleasant experiences, the epitome of which is heaven, swarga. But even that has an end. That also has to come to an end. That is limited. Whatever you want. The technologies of Ayurveda, for example. And just, I would like to mention at this point, uh, one uh, scholar was telling me, even in Ayurveda, which is a technology for uh, taking care of the body, and secondarily the mind too, 
where they say all diseases are traced back not only to the pranamaya kosha to what they call vijnana dosha that there is a problem in our understanding of life in our understanding about ourselves and the world that problem in understanding is translated into mental problems emotional problems that problem which is a mental and emotional problem is translated into a pranic problem where it manifests as psychosomatic diseases and that is transmitted transmitted and and appears as symptoms in our physical body so it is traced back so far to the intellect <laughs> so they will say that uh, if you have a, a tummy ache it's an intellectual problem not in the <laughs> stomach <laughs> yes so this is the there are all these magnificent technologies whatever you want but after all when you realize everything is limited everything is limited and every, everything is haunted by death everything is haunted by impermanence when we realize that then the spiritual seeking awakens then vedanta is there waiting for you now you can come and talk to me yeah. the buddha's insight everything is transitory anityam anityam sarvam anityam at this point if you say doesn't matter if it's transitory if it is if it lasts for a while i don't need a cookie to last for years it'll be it'll be rotten i just need it to last enough for for me to put it in my mouth it's good enough uh, then buddha says go ahead and have a cookie and you'll get the consequences of that too and you do it often enough then you come to the soul comes to a deep understanding that all of it amounts to nothing the buddha says anityam anityam sarvam anityam transitory transitory everything is transitory kshanikam kshanikam sarvam kshanikam momentary momentary everything is momentary shunyam shunyam sarvam shunyam void void everything is void and hence dukkham dukkham sarvam dukkham suffering suffering everything is suffering suffering is suffering and pleasure is also suffering you will say what a spoil sport <laughs> uh, swami tapasyanand ji it seems a very senior monk of our order it seems he used to say when he spoke about buddhism he used to start with buddhism is a serious religion you have to start the first step is that you have to accept everything is surrounded by suffering in this world everything is suffering you inaugurate a new house you're so happy the buddhist comes and says this is the first day of its destruction <laughs> He is right. He is right. He is more right than we are. Which is true. To acknowledge that truth. It's not pessimism. If that's all they said it was it would be pessimism. But the Buddha says there's a cause to this and there is a way out of this. So it is not pessimism. Vedanta also is not pessimism. It shows a way out. But Vedanta takes a long term view of it. You want this world, enjoy it. and we will give you all sorts of technologies to enjoy it every kind of technology which modern man is just beginning to discover in positive psychology and all which is well known to yoga well known to many kinds of um, uh, spiritual technologies developed in india uh, psychological techniques to enhance enjoyment to enhance pleasant experiences in life to enhance life itself longevity but all of it ultimately comes to an end that also one must know it has an expiry date everything comes labeled even heaven comes labeled with an expiry date in uh, hinduism buddhism and indic religions heaven is not eternal these heavens the lower heavens so there is an eternal heaven the heaven of a devotee where the devotee goes to vaikuntha or kailash and lives eternally in the presence of god that's different but heavens that we earn through meritorious action you get joy and then you have to let go swami nishreshan ji used to give that uh, example of uh, of uh, he used to travel from south africa to mumbai so he says i book my ticket on air india if to get money and book your ticket on air india once you enter the plane um it's air condition it may be 40 degrees outside in celsius you know and 100 outside but in the plane it is a comfortable 65 or so, um, so. and then you are this, this is your seat and then uh, you'll be shown a movie and you'll they'll be served good food and you'll be all the time 40000 feet in the air so that's like heaven yeah 
Though today we wouldn't think rail line travel is at all <laughs> heavenly, but anyway. Then what happens? The moment, once you start getting used to it, this is nice. I'm being taken care of, this is very fine. And he says, now we are descending into Mumbai. <laughs> I said, okay. And he said, now, thank you for traveling with Air India. And we hope you, you will come to us uh, again next time. No, I want to stay here. I'm sorry, sir, you have to leave. It is, it is 110 with 100% humidity outside. <laughs> Back you go. If you want to come to heaven again, you have to buy a ticket. <laughs> so just like that, all of it comes to an end. And Vedanta says, then you come to Vedanta and search for that which is eternal, which is permanent, and which happens to be our own real self. And that's what Vedanta shows you. That is what the core of spirituality is. We have 10 minutes. We'll stop here and take a couple of questions and conclude. There's a question there. Yeah. So the I which we experience right now, the I which we experience right now has two parts. One part is a function of the mind, the ego. Aham, aham, I. I am a man, I am, uh, I am an American, I am a tech, uh, I am a, a Californian, I was about to say Texan. Because <laughs> I was in Texas last week, but I know that won't be taken kindly here. Uh, this is the ego. It's a function of the mind. And we always experience this ego as a shining, as a sentient ego. That sentiency in the ego is the reflected consciousness. So when the body dies, the mind is transferred to another body, to another world. The ego goes with it. And the reflected consciousness, the sentiency travels with it. But the pure consciousness does not travel. It is. Always. It pervades everything. It is eternal. It is omnipresent. Unchanging. Yeah. Does that answer your question? So is it the same ego? It is the same ego. Same ego in each, each mind. Each mind has its function as an ego. The I. So when we? Presence. This body, yeah. Yes. In in another body, but it will carry with itself all the experiences which it had in this body as stored up memories. It may not be able to recall. How much can we recall of our own, say, babyhood? Maybe at the most one or two memories. What did you have for dinner um, yesterday at this time? You can tell me. Last week? To scratch. <laughs> Last year? Impossible. Uh, when you were two years old? So what experiences did I have in my past life? According to yoga psychology, it is all there stored up in the chitta, but we cannot access it so easily. But yogis are supposed to be able to access it. Yes. But I'm, I feel I have not exactly answered. You are asking a question. Yes. Yes. Vedanta is very clear about what travels. The physical body is destroyed, Annamaya Kosha. It goes back to the earth. But what travels is the subtle body, the Pranamaya Kosha, Manomaya Kosha, Vijnanamaya Kosha. I'm not talking about the Anandamaya because he has not mentioned it. I'm not talking about it. But anyway, this is what travels to the earth. And consciousness is always there. It is reflected in the pranamaya, manomaya, the manomaya, vijnanamaya, anandamaya. So, uh, it's reflected there. But the pure consciousness is always there. So this, this is the subtle body which travels. It carries with, with us, with it, our distinctive experiences, our memories. So we grow from life to life. You may not remember the exact details of your past lives, but be assured the tendencies that we have ac accumulated in the past lives are here today. That's why siblings are so different. 
Sometimes brothers and sisters, uh, two brothers, two sisters, they're quite different sometimes. Similar in some respects, physically similar, but mentally, in attitudes, they may be quite different. We are ancient. We are all ancient. We are incredibly ancient creatures. Even the, the, the newest, the tiniest baby is a creature millions of years old. Yes, there's a question there. No, it does not travel. So the pure consciousness, it does not travel. That's a good question. It is always there. Where will it travel to? We will see later on all space and time and entire universe is within this Atman. Atman is not in space. Space and time are all within Atman. We'll see all that later on. So Atman exists. It does not travel anywhere. I'll just mention one thing before we go into the question. I'll just, I won't elaborate. This I, why, the reason why he's concentrating on the I is, this I is the one which we grasp, which we are aware of. Now the question is, is this I, we are all aware of this I, we have a knowledge of, of the I. This I, is it knowledge or is it error? The answer Vedanta gives us is it's a mixture of knowledge and error. I exist, knowledge. I am Swami, error. I am this body, error. I am happy, error. I am sad, error. I am ignorant, error. I know Vedanta, I am knowledgeable, error. <laughs> I exist, I shine, I am bliss, or the bliss itself shines forth. That itself is knowledge. That's what we are traveling towards. Everything else is added on to it, will, will drop off. Yes, there is a question here. I will, I'm coming back to you. So, so Jagrat yeah. and Swapna states. Yes. How, what happens to a blind person? A blind person? Yeah. You can always ask. Remember, where is the blindness? It's in the physical body. And it might be a defect in the pranamaya kosha, the subtle body. Not in the Atman. Not in the Atman. So it's, it's a er problem in the physical and physiological body. Uh, so and, the, and the states are in the physical and physiological bodies. Atman is completely unaffected. Uh, in fact, Shankaracharya says this in, in the Adhyasa Bhashya. I am blind. No, rather you are foolish. You are not blind. The particular visual mechanism associated with your subtle body and in this particular life is not functioning properly. You are pure consciousness. How can you be blind? If you are blind, the world will disappear. Uh, I'll come back. Yeah, you had a question. I'm figuring out the difference between uh, Atman and, and Brahman. And, and I have things you've talked about tonight. The difference between Atman and Brahman? The Advaita Vedanta says no difference. The witness consciousness, I'm using the term because this, this text uses the term sakshi, witness. And that's why I'm using the term witness consciousness. This witness consciousness is equal to Atman, is equal to Brahman, and we will see that. It comes later on. Why use two terms if they're exactly the same? The reality within ourselves, Advaita Vedanta calls it the Atman. Atman literally means myself, I, the essence within. The true I, not the ego. And the reality of this universe is called Brahman. Yes. And they are two are same. That's what Advaita Vedanta is trying to tell me. One second. There is a question there. Yes. Is it possible uh, to experience true consciousness without the mind? Is it, like, if, without the mirror, is it possible to understand it? Yes. To the extent that you are aware of your, of your true face without the mirror, to that extent. But a specific knowledge of consciousness requires an activity of the mind and the sense organs or some, some activity in the subtle body which reflects. You know, we, are, we uh, see everybody else's face. We do not see our own faces. There's a beautiful story in Kashmir Shaivism where a devotee of Shiva meditated long and uh, finally um, in a dream, Shiva came to him. And uh, the devotee said, devotee said that, 
Oh Lord, I wanted to see you, but I can't see you. Please show yourself. In my waking state, it's just a dream now, but you can just show yourself. And Shiva said, all right, tomorrow I, I shall appear to you. How? Look for the man with no head. And when he woke up, he thought, everybody has a head. No head. Look for the man with no head. If you see, you are the only one who does not have a head. The way you see it, see the world. You don't actually directly see your own head. So that's the answer, yes. No, Atman is Brahman. That Shivoham, I am Shiva. That is what Shiva wanted to tell. Yes, last question. We'll end now. What is, uh, the Jivatma and Paramatma, uh, the different the distinction between those two. The Jivatma is the Atman in the Jeep what carries it. And Paramatma is the uh, how, how does it differ? I'll give you the precise answer in Vedanta. Jivatman, do you remember what, what I began the talk with? Your face reflected in the mirror is a reflected face. The pure consciousness shining in your mind is a reflected consciousness. God created man in his own image. The image, the consciousness shining in your mind is the Jivatman. That's exactly what we feel ourselves to be. A sentient being with a mind and a body. That is the Jivatman. That reflected consciousness enables this body and mind to function. This body is a living body. The mind functions, thinks and does everything because of the presence of the reflected consciousness. The Sanskrit definition, Dhatu Patha, Sanskrit definition of the word jiva, jiva prana dharane, that reflected consciousness which enables the, the pranamaya kosha, manomaya kosha, vijnanamaya kosha to function, that exactly is the jivatman. If you identify with yourself with that, then you are the reflection, you become the reflection of the Lord. That pure consciousness becomes God then. Lord, I am thy reflection, I am thy creature. You are the Lord. I am thy shadow, thy, thy servant. Literally the servant, the shadow of the Lord. What Vedanta tells us is, you are not a reflection. You are that which is being reflected. That makes the transition from conventional religion to the highest spirituality. Where you become one. Jivatma realizes itself as Paramatma. Thank you very much. We'll conclude here and take it up next. The next... Day is, uh, uh, yes, we, we shall uh, announce the next class. And uh, the next fundamental question to be taken up will be the creation of this universe, no less. <laughs> we are all, so far we're talking about ourselves and pure consciousness. But what about this external universe? How is it created? What is it exactly? All that will be taken up next time. So we covered a lot of ground. How do we have waking and dreaming and deep sleep? What is birth and what is death? All this we have covered. So that was fast work. Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purnat Purnamudachyate Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnamevavashishyate Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tatsat Sri Ramakrishna Rupanamastu